In today's episode, you guys, we're going to dive in down deep in the water to experience some true stories of lake monsters. In the spring of 1782, a French Canadian fur trader of the name of Venant Saint Germain was busy leading a small expedition along the shores of Lake Superior. Now, he was actually accompanied by three other French voyagers, as well as an elderly Ojibwe woman who would serve as their guide and interpreter. Now, the group decided to make camp for the night on a very small uninhabited island nestled right between Isle Royale and the Canadian mainland. Now this was just a little modest island that was known to the Ojibwe as Minas. Now this was merely meant to just be a short stopover, I guess a chance to set up camp and you know put out some fishing nets and stock up on fresh fish before continuing their journey at first light. Now, as the sun began to dip below the horizon and day began to turn to night, Lake Superior changed. Saint Germain and the Ojibwe woman would stay along the rocky shoreline and you know they would check the fishing nets to see if they had caught anything, while the other men would head inland to set up camp. And unfortunately, there was nothing in the nets, they were completely empty, and so Saint Germain took a moment just to take in the spectacular view of the amazing sunset vista. I don't know if you guys have ever stood out on a lake as the sun's setting and the stars are coming out, but it is a beautiful sight to behold. Now he's scanning the horizon, just taking it all in, and he catches sight of something beyond that's very strange and doesn't quite fit in the surrounding scenery. Now roughly an acre or so away from the shore, shoreline just rising above the surface of the water was something that he would describe would be a bizarre creature with what would be the upper body of a human being. Now, St. Germain would later describe this as a very perplexing apparition in vivid detail in a sworn affidavit made before a panel of judges. He took himself pretty seriously, and he would state that the creature also had its torso elevated out of the water with one arm outstretched towards the setting sun. Now, he estimated the size of the creature's upper body to be approximately that of a seven or eight year old child. And the hand was even human-like with five distinct fingers. The other arm seemed to rest casually upon its hip below the waterline. Now he's squinting towards the strange creature and he can make out a distinct human-like face with what he would describe as brilliant shining eyes, a well-formed mouth and nose, and a mouth in proportion to the rest of its features. And the complexion even appeared to be a brownish hue. Its body even seemed to be covered in inch long woolly fur that was grayish black in color. Now, as the confounded Frenchman just stared in complete disbelief, this creature slowly would turn its head and look directly at Saint Germain and his Ojibwe companion. And as you can imagine, the expression on both of their faces were completely dumb struck as they're looking at this thing as well as this thing noticing them it too had a very uneasy and curious expression on its face i mean it was a bizarre spectacle to hold two human beings on shore as they were looking at this thing some creature in the water and so as he's staring at this thing he's glancing over at the woman thinking like there's no way she's seeing this thing too but she was she was not imagining things now she just stood there silent and motionless completely dumbfounded just like he was and so thinking to himself he's like you know what i gotta kill it so he's scrambling to find his musket and he takes aim and he doesn't fire because before he could fire the Ojibwe woman is saying stop do not shoot now she urgently explained to him that it was according to Ojibwe tradition this creature that they were seeing out in the water was a type of water spirit more commonly known as the Maymegwashi now these spirits were said to dwell in caves beneath the lake and were even believed to possess power over the weather. Now of course, Saint Germain dismissed this notion as complete, ridiculous, superstitious nonsense. And he shook the woman's arm off, get off me woman, and began to take him again. But this time his eyes searched the water again and now the creature had completely vanished from sight, completely unsure of where it had went. And so they just kind of give up. And so later on that evening, the island was then ravaged by a sudden and violent thunderstorm. Hmm, interesting how that worked out. 
As you can imagine, the Frenchman remained pretty skeptical because, well, it was just by happenstance. And he definitely didn't really see the connection between the legend and what he saw that night. In the following years to come, he would occasionally speak of this strange encounter to his friends and colleagues and people he had met. And of course, as you can imagine, most would just write it off as careless, unimaginative fantasy. But there were a few fellow voyagers who after hearing his encounter would confide in him their own sightings of similar creatures in and around the Lake Superior area. But none of them could match the vivid descriptions of what he saw, and as time would continue to pass, he would continue to name this island the Place of the Monster. Now even though it's been well over 200 years since Saint Germain and his guide had witnessed such a bizarre event, it is still a mystery to this day because sightings of things in and around the lake continue. Perhaps Perhaps the Ojibwe people really were onto something, and they were a lot more familiar with the things in and outside the water than most of us like to realize. Now this next story I've already told in this video right here, but I'm going to go ahead and retell it again so you don't have to watch this. It was the summer of 1886, and a small team of eager prospectors would cross the Great Lake bound for one of its many remote islands. Now, they were lured, of course, by the rumors of undiscovered copper deposits, and they hoped at the time to completely strike it rich and have it made. And so after landing on a very isolated outcrop, these men spent the first day scouting the area for any signs of copper and preparing their rudimentary diving equipment for an underwater prospecting. They knew there was copper in the area and they were gonna find it. They were not gonna go home empty handed. These men had their hustle going. And so dust began to fall over. And that first evening, the group would set up camp all along the rocky shoreline. And they're getting their gear ready, they're talking, they're getting really pumped up about tomorrow's big find, and they're stoked. So they all gathered around the campfire, and the fire's crackling, and they're just cooking and enjoying each other's camaraderie and company. And they realize that the fire's starting to get low, so they need to go gather more firewood. So the one man gets up, walks into the woods where he's going to gather more, and when he returns, he could see that the others were clearly shaken up by something. And so when he comes back, the other men can see that this guy is clearly shaken up and he's visibly pale. And so they're asking, what happened? Did you see something in the woods? Like, what, what, what's going on with you, buddy? And he explains that he sees something, or I should say he saw something out on the dark water, just as light is beginning to fade more and more. And he described he saw something rising from the depths. This eerie, disgusting green glow had appeared and would slowly spread across the surface of the water. It was almost as if it was some sort of spectral radiance that would bloom outward until it spanned an area that was roughly 30 feet across. And of course, he's recalling these, you know, native tales of vengeful water spirits. And so one of these superstitious prospectors seized his rifle and would fire it right towards the source of the light. And of course, they're all now completely terrified by this, but they're also very tempted by the dreams of striking it big and getting rich. So they would just resolve their efforts and continue in the morning. And so they would bed down for the night, taking turns standing watch to make sure no more strange things happen, although they can't get what happened in the lake out of their minds. Now what had the men seen out in this black water? It was only the beginning of very bizarre things to come. And so the following day, the diver gets all suited up, he's ready to go, he goes down in the water, and he follows this snaking vein of copper along the lake floor until it leads to a yawning opening, the mouth of a very immense underwater cavern. Now this metallic vein kind of continued into the rocky cave, but the length of his air hose prevented further progress. And so he turns to retreat back to the barge, but the diver suit lamp mysteriously blinks out without any single warning and it enveloped him in complete and total pitch blackness. And so now he's blind and disoriented and he's trying to feel his way along the cavern walls, just searching for a way out. And as he stumbles through the darkness in his cumbersome suit, he bumps up against something soft and fleshy. Now at first he assumed it was merely the side of the cavern, but as he began to straighten and orient himself, the spongy mass began to move. Now to his horror, this was no rock wall. 
It was something alive. And before he knew it, it sprang to life and began moving even more and began glowing this ominous green glow that would just pulsate in the darkness. And now he's panicking, unsure of what to do because this was no rock formation. This was a living creature of unfathomable size and power. And so he's desperately trying to get out. And it's at this point, his air hose had become ensnared on the cave floor of some kind, trapping him there as this beast begins to approach. Now, according to this diver's account, this eye emerged from the glow, stopping directly in front of his helmet. Now, acting on primal instinct, he grabs his diving knife and plunges it right in. The blade sinks into the creature's flesh. The injured beast lit up even more brightly until its entire monstrous form was now visible in the green glow. He could see now that this creature looked like some sort of nightmarish just blob of an aquatic mammoth beast, and now they were locked in a struggle for life and death because only one would make it out alive. This creature, whatever it was, was now blocking the exit, and he had no choice but to try and get his way out. And so after he had stabbed it with the knife, it began growing even brighter and brighter in intensity, now suddenly, he could see it writhing and squirming with its tentacles and several massive eyes, and this nightmarish being would completely almost trap him from ever getting out. In fact, it even lashed out at him with one of its snaking appendages, enveloping the diver and constricting him like a giant snake. Now what followed was a frenzied struggle for life and death as the diver would slash wildly at the tentacles gasping for air, all the while this thing yanking violently at the air host keeping him alive. Now strange glowing nodules on the creature's body would flash in odd rhythms, further disorienting him. Now before you know it, water began trickling into his helmet and he knew his time was running out. So summoning every last ounce of strength, he slashed furiously at the monstrous creature and made one final valiant surge towards the cavern's entrance. And with a desperate plunge, he managed to completely sever one of the beast's writhing tentacles. And the injured creature recoiled, releasing its grip on the diver. And as it retreated into the shadows of the cave, its glow rapidly fading. Now, of course, he's exhausted. He's fading and he's trying to do his best to get to the surface. Boom, he bursts down into the open water of the lake. He kicks toward feebly towards the shimmering surface as the black closed in around him. And just as he lost consciousness, breaking into the air above his companions grab onto him from the barge they pull his body up on board and all the divers are completely shaken because they could see how violently he had been struggling with something down below and whatever it was had yanked him so violently it nearly capsized the barge and of course once he came to and he was conscious he told all of his fellow mates how exactly he had gotten there and what had transpired in the waters below and they of course were nothing short of terrified. And that's when they unanimously decided that there's no amount of copper that would be worth another encounter with that thing. And so they made the choice to abandon the site altogether. And well, that's the end of that story for the time being. Now, what's interesting is this first appeared in the Mantawak Pilot newspaper and would be soon published more widely, accumulating details over time. Unfortunately, it was likely sensationalized, and the anonymous diver's first-hand account proves that some unexplained leviathan-like creature does lurk deep within Lake Superior's unfathomable depths. Now, sightings of something strange in Lake Superior does date back centuries and is not just not just some recent thing. In fact, in the 1600s, there were several French missionaries who had recorded accounts who would describe a fearsome aquatic beast. In fact, there was one priest in particular, Paul Lejeune, who allegedly witnessed a tribesman capture a young creature resembling what he would describe as a 10-foot creature, or excuse me, a lizard with a turtle's head. Now, they quickly released it back into the lake, believing harming it would summon catastrophic degrees of storms. But folks, it was the 1890s that brought a wave of more concrete sightings by outsiders. In 1894, there were crews on two separate steamships between Whitefish Point and Copper Harbor that had reported spotting a large underwater creature, that it had an arched serpentine back protruding around seven feet above the surface. Now, the following summer, an even more ominous encounter would occur near Whitefish Point. 
a steamer crew spied a hideous thing swimming nearby. A huge head and a long, undulating neck estimated at 15 feet long, and it seemed to almost pace their ship as if stalking prey. But the most terrifying run-in would come near 1897 near Duluth, Minnesota. A yachtsman would fall overboard and claim to have actually been attacked by some unknown creature, and he described that it tried to actually constrict around him like a giant snake. And in his desperate struggle in the water, it was witnessed by three others aboard the yacht. Clearly, there was something massive and mysterious lurking in the cold depths of Lake Superior, and it was not afraid to reveal itself to the growing number of outsiders encroaching on its domain in the late 19th century. Now, the creature's identity ultimately remained unknown, but its menacing presence could no longer be denied or dismissed as mere legend. There truly is something in Lake Superior, but what it is, we don't know. In the 1980s, two fishermen had an alarming encounter while casting their lines near Cleveland's East 55th Street Marina. Now, it was just after dawn on an otherwise calm morning when their 20-foot boat, the cool breeze, was suddenly jolted by a violent disturbance in the water. Now, as the men tried to study themselves, they would look overboard and see this immense dark shape in the depths below. It was at least as long as their fishing boat and resembled what they would describe as a giant alligator in form. Now, before the witnesses could react, two long arms reached out and forcefully grabbed onto the hole, shaking the vessel violently. Now, the fishermen held on, desperately trying not to capsize as the huge creature maintained its grip on the boat. But just as quickly as it had appeared, it then released the craft and glided away into the gloomy water. In September of 1990, Sandusky Bay in Lake Erie was the site of a dramatic encounter with an elusive cryptid known more commonly as Bessie. A Harold Bricker was out fishing on the bay with his wife Cora and son Robert when he would spot something anomalous in the water roughly 1,000 feet away. Now, according to Harold's account, a giant serpentine creature was swimming in the surface of the water and described it as jet black in color and around 40 feet in length. Now, Harold's sighting was corroborated by five other witnesses all along the shoreline who all reported seeing the same thing as he did, word for word of the sighting. And of course, it began spreading rapidly, spurring a renewed interest in the legend around the area. Now, a man by the name of Thomas Solberg, who is the owner of the Huron Lagoon Marina, even posted a 1000 excuse me $100,000 reward for capture of a live specimen of Bessie an offer which folks still stands today despite no attempts to claim it in fact more recent sightings have followed there was a witness by the name of Franklin P. Wainwright, and he would share his own frightening experience with Weird Ohio while fishing alone near Vermilion in his 18-foot Boston whaler. Now, he claimed that it happened on a calm summer night as he was anchored alone in his boat out on Lake Erie. Now, at the time, he was plagued by insomnia, and he had developed a very unfortunate habit of drinking a few beers out in the water where the rocking in the boat would eventually kind of lull him into a sleep. But on this particular night, he was awakened from one of these impromptu slumbers by a very alarming sensation, something forcefully rubbing against the hull of the boat. And so he hears the rush of displaced water followed by a loud on the surface. And so he springs up, grabs his lantern that he always tries to keep burning just to avoid collisions in the night. And he rushes to the rail looking out and he holds out the light over the dark water to get a look at what had jarred him from his sleep. And what he sees next is forever etched into his memory. Now, we should be clear here that he was not drunk. He'd been asleep for a few hours and only had had a few beers, so this was no alcohol-induced hallucination. Come on, guys. Do you realize the amount of alcohol you'd have to consume to start hallucinating? Let's be real. The thing that supposedly breached the surface before him was far different than he could have ever imagined. As he stared wide-eyed over the rail, this immense creature broached and rolled, revealing a serpentine body of at least 25 feet in length as big around as a telephone pole. 
Now he described its hide being like a mossy green color and it glimpsed massive fins or flippers on its sides before it slipped beneath the waves. Now the whole incident lasted no more than 10 seconds, but it felt to him as if time itself stood still and had primal fear surging through his body as anybody would after witnessing something that the rational mind cannot begin to make sense of. Now, after that initial alarming scrape against the hole, he holds out the lantern out anticipating this thing's return and the surface just remained still. Now, to his horror, he realized it had intentionally struck the boat as if warning him that he should leave its territory. He was thinking to himself that this was a real living Leviathan creature, that this was some biological creature, not some floating log or optical illusion. Now, after that experience, he would describe that when others come aboard his ship, he does warn them and would even go into detail how insomnia he faced afterwards had only gotten worse. Another interesting creature comes to us from Lake Michigan. Now, just like the other Great Lakes in the area, Lake Michigan is full of strange and unidentified creatures. In fact, one of the earliest documented sightings occurred on August 16th, 1867 near Hyde Park in Chicago. A witness named Josh Mulk would gaze out over the glimmering water and would spot what he would describe as a vast monster, part fish and part serpent, measuring around 40 feet long and as wide as a barrel, and would go on to describe that it had a triangular seal-like head with prominent eyes and swam with an undulating snake-like motion before going down beneath the waves. Now, his bizarre encounter was just the beginning because that same summer, Crews aboard the tugboat Crawford and propeller ship Skylark would report a frighteningly close brush with the beast while offshore of Evanston. They described it violently thrashing its tail and churning the waters all around the vessel, with both crews continuing to see the creature on multiple occasions that month alone. Now, according to subsequent accounts, the animal was eel-like in its appearance, ranging from 30 to 60 feet in length, with a distinctly reptilian head. The sightings would persist for years to come, of course, leaving all witnesses baffled because nobody knows what it was. And in late March of 1893, a naval officer by the name of H.R. Brinkerhoff witnessed the creature while reading in his quarters at Fort Sheridan. Now, peering out his second story window overlooking the lake, he spots a large black shape around 40 feet long gliding across the surface. So struck by what he saw, he calls over a fellow officer to confirm the bizarre sighting. He never did find out what it was, but one compelling eyewitness account would come from 1885, quoted in the Portland Daily Press. The creature would poke its head up and they would see it plainly with their naked eyes through their glasses. The head was very large, dark above and light underneath, and they could not see the features distinctly, but it looked to appear to have an alligator's head. The creature would appear to actually become stuck in a patch of ice near the pier. Now the effort seemed to revive it and it disappeared, but quickly came again to the surface at an identical spot where they had first got a good view of it. It would look toward the witnesses for a second, then turn around and make its way directly out into the lake. It would describe almost a letter S with its body in turning and they got an excellent view of it. They saw it, but they don't know what it was. However, skeptics would continue to dismiss the sightings as mere misidentifications or just mundane objects or outright hoaxes. Still, reports would persist into the early 1900s. In fact, one of the last major encounters would occur in 1937, and it was witnessed by the crew of the passenger ship SS Theodore Roosevelt, with a Captain G.E. Stufflebeam describing spotting a 60-foot-long creature while four miles offshore. Now, this happened when illuminated by the ship's floodlights. It writhed and twisted through the water at remarkable speeds, and passengers crowded the deck shouting questions as the reptilian form swam away, flipping its tail before submerging down. Of course, Shufflebeam had no explanation for what he and his veteran crew had just bore witness to but in their experienced eyes, it matched no whale or fish known to inhabit the lake. Now, I know we've been hanging out a lot around the Great Lakes, but I feel like for this next part, we need to go far, far to the west 
and to China. In August of 1962, at the beautiful lake of Tianchi, an extraordinary event would unfold. A witness who was peering through a telescope caught sight of two massive creatures in the lake. Now, they appeared to be engaged in a playful chase, a dance of giants amidst the tranquil waters. This sighting would ignite a frenzy of reports. Over a hundred individuals would come forward, each recounting their own encounter with this elusive monster of Lake Tianchi. The descriptions of this creature were as varied as they were intriguing. Some spoke of a colossal fish dominating the lake with its size. Others would describe it something being more fantastical, a creature resembling a plesiosaur, a relic from a bygone era, and it was said to have a long neck capped with a head the size of a human's. But what made it particularly distinctive was the striking white ring encircling the bottom of its neck, contrasting sharply with its smooth gray skin. Then in July of 2003, an encounter of a different kind took place. A group of 12 Chinese soldiers stationed near the lake witnessed a very astonishing sight. They observed a creature markedly different from previous descriptions. This being had a black head adorned with two four inch horns. Its back was covered in prominent scales, a display of ancient power and mystery. And for two whole minutes, the soldiers would watch in awe as it glided through the water, almost a kind of silent sentinel of the deep. And then as quickly as it had appeared, it vanishes beneath the waves. Now what's interesting is the Chinese state news agency, Xinhua, later reported that this wasn't an isolated incident. In fact, within a span of just 50 minutes earlier that month, the creature had been spotted five additional times that month. Now, reports of this elusive monster persist into modern times, occasionally even captured on video. In September of 2007, journalist Shui Yongsheng witnessed something incredible while the lake shore. Yongsheng observed a pod of six unidentified creatures swimming in unison across the lake and would describe them as seal-like in appearance with prominent fins or possibly wings that exceed their body length and managed to film over 20 minutes of blurry footage, which is why I'm only showing you an image. Young Shank recalled that they could swim as fast as yachts, and at times they would all disappear in the water. It was impressive to see them all acting at exactly the same pace as if somebody was giving them orders. The creature's capabilities seemed to defy logic. The frigid volcanic lake should be in inhospitable to large animals, yet the video clearly depicts them cavorting through its depths. Of course, some speculated that they could represent an undiscovered whale or a freshwater seal uniquely adapted to the extreme environment. Others hypothesized some mutant strain of gigantic fishes at play, but their true nature remains a mystery. Now, again, let's travel a little bit further, because if we go northwest into the region of Xinjiang, this is where the stunning azure emerald waters of Lake Canis are. Formed from an ancient glacier supposedly over 200 years ago, it is the deepest lake in China and famed for its breathtaking scenery. But beyond its beauty, it harbors a strange mystery. Legends of strange creatures inhabiting the lake stretch back centuries with tales of them snatching up livestock from the shores. Now their existence alone was thrust into the modern era in the 1980s. In fact, in 1985, a professor, Yuan Guang, was visiting this lake with students when they spotted something strange and unbelievable. Now, according to their account, an enormous group of 50 gigantic fish surfaced, reddish brown in color and measuring between 30 and 50 feet long apiece. He estimated they exceeded four tons each. Now, this astonishing sighting would spark a flood of reports from awestruck tourists and locals alike with creatures surfacing periodically ever since. Their massive size and distinctly reptilian features defy any known species in the lake. In 2013, hundreds witnessed the beast simultaneously, confounding attempts to dismiss them as fiction. Further enhancing the mystery, this lake is one of the most photographed lake monsters in the world, with numerous images of anomaly beasts captured on camera. Now, expeditions have scoured the depths, attempting to validate the 
the phenomenon, but the creatures continue to elude capture or scientific identification. Now, theories abound as to what the elusive lake monsters could be, and the most prominent idea is that they represent some mutant strain of the native salmonoid fish called Tymon. These are river-dwelling cousins of salmon, and they are known to reach 10 feet in length and nearly 300 pounds, dwarfing most salmon species. Skeptics suggest that witnesses are merely misidentifying huge schools of migrating salmon that swarm the lake, or that floating logs and debris are being mistaken for living beasts. Perhaps the most bizarre Chinese lake monsters of all are said to come in the form of not giant fish or dinosaurs, but get this, gargantuan pale-skinned man-eating toads. Yeah, these accounts originate from the rugged, remote, mountainous region of Hubei province in central China. The deep water gorges and lakes here are pristine and beautiful, but according to local lore, they are inhabited by monstrous amphibians. The most infamous of these was a toad named Chan, which has made its home in one of the lakes and relentlessly attacks anything that approaches. Now, Chan would supposedly snatch up pets and livestock at the shore using its massive jaws. The creature even began encroaching further inland, striking fear into all villagers. Fed up with Chan's shenanigans, some local fishermen hatched a plan to get rid of it for good. So they would begin getting in boats out onto the lake and, as extreme as it sounds, began hurling explosives at this thing in an attempt to kill it. But, of course, this reckless act only further enraged Chan. The injured toad furiously erupted from the depths and chased the men far along the shore, snapping at them with its huge mouth as they fled for their lives. But by the luck, they panicked and managed to escape mostly unscathed. Now, after this, they refused to go anywhere near that part of the lake ever again. Having learned their lesson about provoking this outsized amphibian, they understood and respected it more. Now, tales of Chan and its man-eating kin still do circulate in the region to this day. In fact, in 1987, an expedition led by Professor Chen Mok Chun went to the Hubei mountain lakes along with other scientists, nine to be exact, aiming to catalog and observe aquatic life rather than search for monsters. Yet monsters they would find. While setting up camp beside a deep gorge, three colossal albino toads with six foot wide mouths surfaced and began swimming toward the stunned group. Now, according to the account, one toad actually lashed out with its tongue to snag a camera tripod, trying to drag it into the water to eat. The creatures then unleashed otherworldly shrieks before vanishing back into the murky depths below, leaving the scientist completely bewildered and shocked. Reports of other bizarre lake beasts across China are abound. At the remote Qinghai Lake, which is north of Qinghai Tibet Plateau, there is said to be a snake-headed dragon creature with shimmering scales. In western Hubei's Xinanjia region, a beast with gray skin, an oblate head, giant eyes, and five-toed forelimbs have been described, and Winbu Lake in Tibet allegedly harbors an ox-like monster with a small head, long neck, and gray-black skin. Now, from giant fish to prehistoric relics, there does seem to be proof for amphibians for these people. The real question is, how do these elusive creatures persist without clear documentation or even physical evidence? Either way, it's clear that from today's episode, there is certainly something in our lakes that we cannot understand and defy any and all rational explanation. And because you guys have made it this far into the video, I want you to all comment down below, we're gonna go swim. So that way I know who made it to the end of the video and well, who didn't. And if you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that big old red subscribe button and the like button. It's just, you know, cause it helps out the channel and you know, I get to grow more and bring all of you more of these interesting tales. As always, I love you all, keep an open mind and I'll see you guys in the very next episode.